Father, thank you for your kindness and your grace and the opportunity to read your word. And we pray, Lord, as we consider these things, that you would lead us, bless us, guide us, convict us, encourage us, equip us. Uh, Lord, we are excited uh, that you're doing great things on this planet and to be a part of that. So we praise you for your kindness in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So last week, if you recall, we did look at uh, uh, Acts chapter 12, but we looked at it in a sense more of a concept, if you were here uh, or if you were not here. And the concept ultimately was this, and and to me it's a a very stark example that just bad things happen. And the example that we have in Acts chapter 12 is Herod, who is Agrippa I. Uh, You can do some history on that if you'd like. But Herod... Uh, arrest James. It says some of the brothers and James. And he immediately executes James. And the way the wording there is, it seems to be something that took place very quickly. There was an arrest of a group of people. He pulls James out. It's, it's uh, uh, the brother of John, uh, the, the twins that try to call down fire on the Samaritans. So he pulls James out of that group of people and is, he's immediately executed. When Herod, who, all, who has, uh, wants to appeal to the Jewish people for political reasons, and also because he would esteem himself as somewhat of a, of a Jew convert, he arrests Peter in order to execute him. But Peter is set free. So you have this kind of stark difference in the same event with two outcomes. Does that make sense? In other words, James is arrested and executed, But Peter is arrested and set free. And really, all we looked at for the most part the entire morning last week was this idea is why. The whys of life. Why does Peter live and James dies? James has a brother. James had family. Some people say, and and I think meaning well, we're not putting anybody down, but they look at Acts, and it is noteworthy that in the first part of it, 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 there's no mention of prayer for James, but then it does say that they earnestly prayed for Peter, and he is released. And then the outcome becomes, well, because the church prayed, Peter was released, and because they didn't pray, James was slain. And that's a risky doctrine, and it's based on omission, which just means something that's left out, and you create a rule about it. Because we have no idea. The church, it's not like they have Instagram. It wasn't like James took a selfie of himself as he's being carted off by the police and taken to prison so that everybody could pray, or some sort of church newsletter, or the prayer chain. That None of that existed. You literally had a, a town, a place, he's arrested, and he's executed. So trying to make a doctrine that was prayer, I think, would be risky at best. But having said that, we still have to answer, why do these things happen? Why is it that one person is slain and one person is not? And and, uh, some very excellent verses we looked at there in uh, in Luke, where Jesus makes the point, he says, hey, look, do you think when the Tower of Shalom fell on 18, it's 18 people, there was some discussion of that, it fell on 18 people, he says, "Jesus, Jesus says, do you think that those 18 people were more sinful than the rest? He says, no, I tell you they weren't. And then he says, and, but you'll perish also, or likewise, if you don't repent. And then he says, do you think when Pilate slew those Jews and then mingled their blood with pig's blood and made a sacrifice out of it, he goes, do you think that they were more sinful than all the rest? He says, no, they weren't. He says, but I tell you that you also will perish likewise if you don't repent. And his point is, remember, Jesus is always taking physical and bringing it to eternal. His point is not to everybody speaking to at that place and then recorded for us. If you don't repent, then a tower is going to fall on you. Or if you don't repent, you know, you're going to get your blood mixed with swine blood. If if that was literally what he was saying, then there'd be a lot of towers falling and there'd be a lot of people getting their blood mingled with swine's blood, right? So can we agree he was speaking on an allegorical, on an eternal idea that, that everyone will perish regardless of their sinfulness if they don't repent? And so a lot of the the why of why do things happen in the world ultimately is sin. And we talked about that, sin being linked to man rather than angels or Satan. Sin that when we fell, the world fell. And so now because of our sin, in many, many, many instances, it causes uh, causes destruction. Uh, Including in our own personal conversations, including in our dialogues at our jobs, all those things. When we choose sin, it always ends up. And devastation. And just as why God doesn't stop every bad thing from the really bad people, He doesn't stop the bad thing from us either, as we might look at it. 
So today, I wanted to look at a little, a little less conceptual because we didn't actually talk about the fact that Peter is delivered, which is great, right? We don't, we don't say it's not good that he was delivered because James died. That would be weird. We rejoice in the fact that, that for whatever reason, James went on to be with the Lord, and Peter gets to stay. Interesting fact, though, remember, Peter ultimately gets crucified. Tradition tells us upside down with his wife. Tradition tells us that Peter's last words were to call to his wife and to encourage her, stay strong, as they, uh, as they executed her also. So he doesn't forever escape the execution. In fact, he goes on to have a way worse execution than what is believed happened to James, which was just that he was his beheaded, that he was killed by, by Herod. So when we look at this deliverance, there's a rejoicing that God furthered his purpose. Now, I'm going to actually also do something today that I pretty much never do. It's called allegory. (laughs) I'm not a super big fan of it, but I do think it has its place. And as I was reading this and kind of considering how do we go through and how do we look at what Peter's done here, how do we digest and how do we adopt this for ourselves? And there's a pretty tremendous, uh, I think, a pretty tremendous uh, example here for us of how we too can experience freedom. Because Peter gets set free, but he doesn't do it in a manner that is uh, super spectacular. He doesn't do it in a manner that seems to be uh, anything of his own efforts. He doesn't try really hard. He doesn't work really hard. He just does a few simple things, and that ends up to freedom in his life, which is, I think, what we want. Don't we want freedom from being ruled by our emotions? Don't we want freedom from being ruled by our sin, by our addictions, by our cravings, by you know, just habitual things that we do, habitual thought processes that never seem to go away, always responding in pride or always responding in lust, always responding in condemnation, always responding in anger, ways that somehow they get ingrained in us and we, we can't seem to shake them, we can feel powerless, we feel like we don't know how we can move beyond it. And there's, I think, some cool things in here that, that Peter demonstrates for us that we can adopt into our literal lives. And we'll start here. It says there in verse 6, Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And I think the first thing that I would say there is this. The first step that Peter took is he went to sleep. And again, this isn't some teaching where it was like, well, Peter had peace, and you should too, so just go to sleep when you're having problems. That's actually my coping mechanism, if I'm going to be honest. Like, this really sucks, I'm going to go take a nap, (laughs) you know? I don't want to deal with this. But the, the reality is, here's Peter, think about this, he's on the eve of his execution. It's probably pretty plain to him, it's not noted for us here, but it seems pretty obvious what's, what about, is about to go down. The fact that Peter is about to be executed, the very night that he's to be executed. He's chained to two soldiers, and there's two soldiers that are in the front of the gate, or not the gate, but the the door to his particular cell. Now, remember, it wasn't that many years ago or that long ago that Peter had been miraculously delivered from prison. Remember that? He and John end up in prison, and they are miraculously delivered, and they get out of prison, and they go to the temple the next day to Solomon's porch, and they begin to preach Uh, The good news of this life is is what they're commanded to preach. And they do that. But at the same time, how is it that Peter fell asleep? It can be, you know, for many of us, I think, whether it's anxiety or anger or whatever reason, I'm not talking about physical problems here. I'm not talking about insomnia as a physical problem. But I'm talking about the, the emotional states of our lives that so often can bereave us of sleep. But the first thing he does, what we see in Peter's life, is he just falls asleep in the very place that he's at. But remember, Peter didn't start here. One of the things I really like about Peter is he has a a pretty colorful testimony. A lot of failures, including failures that are going to follow him way, you know, I don't know, about a decade from now, when he ends up having to be confronted by Paul and told, hey, you're falling back into Jewish tradition, so much so that you're rejecting people that aren't Jewish. You won't even eat with them. Kind of interesting that even all the way back to the first century church, they were having problems. I don't want to harp on this too much, but I think it's very important for us as Christians to realize that the church has always been rough. It always has. We can't let our eyes roll back in the back of our heads and start in this emotion of bliss, just be like, the early church, bro, they just did everything right. No, they didn't. Their apostles separated based on race. You're not Jewish. I'm not going to eat with you. Peter did that. 
The churches always have problems. They have to decide, can Gentiles really be saved? It takes years to decide that. They have to actually have like a couple of meetings where the bigwoods get together in Acts 15. Um, are we really sure that they can get saved? Peter says, yeah, you know what? I saw him receive the Spirit. There were other brothers with me too. Paul says, yeah, I've seen the same thing. And they have to be like, oh, okay, all right then. We've made a ruling. Gentiles can officially get saved. So this, there's always been this rockiness. That's one of the things I love about Peter. The fact that it's Peter that has to be called two or three times. Remember, it's Jesus who, who meets with him and says, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And he ditches out on that, and he ends up going fishing again. And it's not until he's mending his nets on the, on the side of the uh, 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 Lake uh, Gennesaret that Jesus sees him and has to say, no, I want you to follow me. So it's, here's this, this whole problem. It's Peter that three times denies the Lord right in front of Jesus with an eyesight of Jesus. And says, I don't know the man. Finally, with an oath, with a curse saying, I don't know the man. It's Peter. So it's that same Peter, this Peter that's wrought with failure, this Peter that's wrought with unbelief. The same Peter is the Peter who's asleep, chained to two guards. On the night he's going to be executed. I think one of the, the best illustrating stories of this, of how, how things can work out in our own lives, is you remember when Peter walked on the water. Peter is there. <clears throat> he's in the boat. They see Jesus, they start screaming because they think it's a ghost, which as a side note is a pretty interesting thing in itself. The disciples believed in apparitions that they might see one on the ocean, so much so they got scared by it. But they, they scream out because they think Jesus is a ghost, and, and when they realize it's, he's not a ghost, that it's actually the Lord, Peter says to him, hey, call to me so that I can come to you on the water. And so Jesus says, yes, come to me. And so Peter gets out of the boat. He begins to do this miraculous thing. He walks on the water, but then he begins to sink. He sees, it says that he saw the wind and the waves, that they were great, they were large, and he began, he began to doubt, and he began to sink. And then he cries out, and he, says, and he says, save me. One of the best prayers, I think, in the Scripture. You don't have to be like holy and elaborate when you're drowning and things are just rough. He's like, I got nothing, save me. Save me. It's not like Jesus said, well, what do you want me to do for you? Can you elaborate that? I, Lord, save me. And he's, Jesus immediately raises, or reaches out his hand and pulls him, pulls him up out of the water. Now, my, my opinion, and you can throw this in the trash, my opinion is not that Jesus grabbed him by the hand and like threw him over his back and you know, carried him back to the boat and like set him back in, you know, some fireman's carry or something like that. I don't think that happened. The scripture doesn't tell us what happened, but I think the idea is that he reached and he grabbed him by the hand and they walked back to the boat together. That's my opinion. The scripture doesn't say that. But I find it hard to believe that Jesus was like, Whoosh, and like chucked him back in the boat. So here you have this instance where here's Peter, where Peter has, he has the, the approval of God, the endorsement of God. He's got the literal Jesus in front of his face and he steps out in this miraculous way that Jesus has called him to step out in, in plain view of his Savior, and yet somehow the circumstances became greater than what he was observing in Christ. And I think this is kind of a regular thing for us as Christians, many of us, myself included in that number, where we can really struggle with what the Word says versus what's happening in our lives. So the point I'm trying to make in this, in this first point, is this, that Peter was asleep because he literally had about... Oh, guesstimating 15 to 20, well, 10 to, 10 to 15 years of experience with walking with the Lord. And a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes in those 15 years, much like ourselves. And a lot of us, we can let our circumstances, we can let what we're wrestling with dictate our rest. We can let what, what we think about, what's going on in our minds, we can let that decide whether we're going to sleep or not, whether we're going to be at peace at not or not. And so I th you know, one of the, the, the things that we have to realize, and I talked about this last week, and I, and I want to be uh, very careful um, not to just continually repeat myself, but I think for many of us, what happens is we are literally waiting just to be changed. And, and, and again, this is an important point for our rest. And what I mean by that is this. God has put forward so many ways for us to be able to move forward with Him. 
He's given us, you can call them tasks if you want to or whatever it is, he, but he's given us ways that we can be victorious. But a lot of times those ways are difficult or they take time or they can be upsetting or whatever they might be. But the reality is that for many of us, myself included, we're kind of sitting on our couch self-medicating in some way, just waiting to feel different. Whether it's anger or anxiety or whatever it is, it's lust, we, we, we deal with things, and we can like, for, whether it's napping <laughs> or alcohol or Netflix or weed or whatever it is, we continue in these veins and attempting to self-medicate thinking that one day we'll just kind of wake up from our stupor, like we'll shut Netflix off at one in the morning after dealing with our depression with, with entertainment, and we'll just somehow be changed when we wake up in the morning. And then when we wake up in the morning and we still have the same emotional state or we're walking through it, we're, we, we're bewildered as to why does that happen? Why am I not changed? Or we can, you know, there's, there's different venues that that can occur with. But my point is that there is a way that God has given us that we can be changed. One of my favorite verses about this is in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 30. If you want to flip over there. Um, in Isaiah chapter 30, and in uh, verse 15, He says this, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved, and in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling, and you said, No, we will flee upon horses, therefore, shall, uh, therefore you shall flee away. And we will ride upon swift steeds, therefore your pursuers shall be swift." A thousand shall flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you shall flee till you are left, like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Verse 18, therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those that wait for him. So at this point in Israel, Israel has been rebellious for centuries. And it's kind of an up and down walk with the Lord, as it were. Uh, and, and if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you're probably familiar with that concept. And maybe perhaps in your own life also. But what happens is this is a point where Israel has begun to outreach to other nations for help and deliverance in armament to protect themselves from their enemies. Does that make sense? And so the Lord is speaking to them through Isaiah, and he's saying basically, and there's, we're, we're jumping in the middle of a thought, so please forgive me for that. But he's saying to them, what you're doing is wicked, and it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you enormously. And what he says here, his reply to them, or his encouragement to this, is he says, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. And he's going to go on there. He's going to say, no, you cannot be saved from your enemies by getting faster horses. Because that's their claim, right? He says, you say that, no, we will have fast steeds. And so we'll be able to escape our enemies because we're getting fast horses. And I believe it's from Egypt, if I'm not mistaken. But he says, no, because you're looking to other means, what's going to happen is your pursuers will also be fast. And they will chase you until you are isolated like a flagpole on top of a hill. Kind of, maybe you can kind of envision that in your mind. This idea of a lonely pole just step on a hill all by itself, surrounded by the enemies that were able to keep up with them. So he, he makes the point to them, he says this, the way of salvation is not personal equipment. It's not trying to find ways, natural ways, to deal with your problems and what's going on in your life. And it's true, isn't it? Because he, he makes a great illustration for us. No matter, how, <laughs> no matter how we try to deal with our problems, there will always be a problem that we can't deal with. You ever heard like the expression, there's always someone smarter than yourself? That's how problems work too. There comes a point in our lives where we just can't deal with the problems that happen to us. 
We can't in our own selves overcome whether it be physical trial or emotional trial or a, a, a fiscal trial. We just can't overcome it anymore. And even though we've tried with our Netflix or booze or weed or whatever it might be to try to suppress or to find peace in those things, they always outrun us. But there's a very, very easy way, if you will, to find rest. And notice he says it's in returning and rest. He doesn't say just return and you'll find rest. He says, no, keep returning to find rest. It's in that returning and resting in Christ that we find our peace. It's not just some one-time thing where we come up and we have this emotional event, which emotional events are great, and God bless them. But emotional events don't make our problems go away. Continually returning to Christ and admitting what's happening allows us to walk in and accept the problems that we have and to let God work them out. In this case... They're, they're physically threatened. And God says, I would protect you in returning in rest. Now, that's a, that's a word to them. There's no physical promise of protection for all of us for the rest of our lives. But for them in this time, he makes this promise. But he makes the point, he says, you were unwilling. And I think for many of us, this is kind of the, this is the problem. This is the crux. This is where it happens. We have this issue in our life, whatever it might be, whether it's an addiction issue, a, a thought process issue. And when I say thought process, I'm not trying to wax uh, psychological. Nobody has to worry. The Bible is the answer. I'm not saying anything weird. But the, the idea that we get in thought loops, right? We get in ways of thinking. If you have anxiety about something, I don't want to bring up anything because then you'll just think about that for the rest of the time. But if you, if you have something in, in, in your life that you continually, you kind of get in that cycle and it's hard to break out, we'll use hatred. Anybody here ever been wronged before? Maybe one of us, right? When you get wronged, you can dwell on that wrong, right? Oh, wrong, right. You can dwell on that. You can begin to think about it. That person wronged me. They deserve this because they wronged me. They should get this because they wronged me, and I should do this because they wronged me. And I, and I can think about that. And I can dwell. Anybody ever dwelt on a wrong that's occurred in their life? And you just mull it and mull it and mull it and mull it, and then it just goes away and everything is fine. No. That's not what happens, is it? It, it gets deeper and deeper, and pretty soon you're like, what am I going to do? I need to take action. I need my swift steed. I'm going to handle this. I'm going to get justice. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And actually what ends up happening is you destroy at least part of yourself and your life, don't you? Because now all of a sudden there's a lack of fellowship. When you talk to other people, when we're, when we're in those thought loops, what do we talk about? Jesus is so good. I'm just so thankful. No. It's, did you, can you believe this? And it can be anything. It can be fear-based. It can be... Uh, Anger-based, it can be lust-based, it can be loneliness-based, it can be greedily-based, and we just get in these crazy loops, and there's never any deliverance, and there's never any fellowship. And so Jesus comes along through Isaiah here, and he's telling, he says, look, it's going to be through turning and rest, but check this out, you were unwilling. Somehow, we come to this point that we say, I don't think God's way is going to work. Or in our rebellion, we say, I'm not going to use God's way because I'm so chapped about what happened to me. And then we can go on these even weirder paths where we start to say, you should not have let that happen to me, God. You should have done this instead of that, God. You should have done it this way or that way, or maybe even this way, but the way you did it was wrong. And we, we, we go to these loops where now we're blaming God. It's his fault. It's his fault. So it's a, it's, a, it's a dangerous game. He says, you would not. But then he's going to go on, because it's really great. Because you would not, in verse 18, this is God's response. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. It's funny, because the Old Testament God really gets this bad rap. And there's this idea that like the Old Testament God was very upset, very angry, just kind of killed people for fun. And then Jesus kind of came along and was like, Dad, chill out. And then he died on the cross, and then boom, it's like everybody's happy again, and there's grace. The Old Testament God is the same God he's always been. Even to this century old, centuries-old rebellious people, God's plan for them, when they're ignoring him, 
He says, I'm going to wait for you. Now, was there fruit and fallout from them ignoring God? 100%. Multiple times it was slavery. Multiple times it was the loss of their children. Multiple times it was the loss of, it was war. Fiscal loss. There was radical loss every single time they disobeyed God. But that was loss that occurred because they didn't walk in what God had for them. It wasn't even punitive loss per se. Sometimes he did bring in other nations to correct his people to bring them back to himself. But it was just, it was the effect of ignoring what God had for them. So in this case, he says, here's my big plan. It's not condemnation. It's not wrath. It's not anger. It's not destruction. That's, what, that's our plan, right? When, when people are, have ignored us to a certain point, we're like, okay, then that's the way it's going to be, and you get nothing from me. But God's plan is this. I'm going to wait for you until you're stuck on that hill all by yourself, wrecked, weeping, and lonely. And then I'm going to be so gracious to you. I'm going to wait for you so that I can be gracious to you. Paul said some similar stuff about thwarting God's grace in our life, about thwarting his purpose in our life, or at least I should say his will in our life. We have this amazing ability of thwarting what God wants to do when realistically he's waiting for you to pour out his grace upon you. These are all steps. These are all ways. How do you fall asleep chained to two different people knowing you're going to be executed? You return again and again. And when, you have, when, you, when we, I should say, ignore what God is calling us to or what God's saying in our life, we repent and we return again and again. And what are we met with? Hebrews tells us it's a throne of grace. Here we're told that it's, he's waiting to have grace upon us. And not only that, he says he exalts himself to show mercy to you. When we exalt ourselves, it's usually to show people that we can dominate them. We're better than them. I exalt myself, puff, ah, you know, whatever it is, like puff myself up. Like you ever seen like two dudes that are like ready to, they're either going to cry or they're going to fight, right? And they're like all puffed up, like it's self-exaltation. And just look at me. Look what I can do. You ever seen two animals, a couple of roosters, and they like puff up and their little neck thing comes out, or whatever it might be? That's how all nature, fallen nature works. But God's nature is this. I'm going to exalt myself. I'm going to show you how great I am and how wonderful I am so that you'll come to me so I can be merciful to you. It's like unthinkable. It's like, it's like how does that dynamic even work where God says, look how great I am. Now I can be kind to you because you'll actually accept it. See, this is, this is how you fall asleep. This is how you find rest. It's how you find peace is you come back to Christ when he's calling to you, when you hear what he has to say to you, when you see the promises. It doesn't mean that you never fail. It means that you keep coming back. The righteous man falls seven times and seven times he gets up, gets up again. The righteous man Not the sinful, unrighteous man. The righteous man falls seven times. And seven times he gets up again. God has great things for us. And if you're ignoring him in your life right now, he's not condemning you. He's waiting for you. Because he's got grace for you and kindness for you. He's got mercy for you. The way to find rest in the most terrible of circumstances is to continually come back to God's word And to pray it through and allow him to work in your heart. Flip back over to Acts chapter 12. Second thing. Sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains... Two centuries before the door regarding the prison, verse 7, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood up next to him, and light shone in his cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. So I want to draw attention to our, that last portion there. So he's in the cell. The angel appears. The cell gets all bright. It's kind of interesting. I don't have an application for it. But the, the idea is the, the word there that he struck him, it's literally like smote. Like every time you see King James, he, someone is smote. It's like he hit him for whatever reason. Maybe he's a deep sleeper. I don't know. But it's not that he like, hey, buddy, wakey, wakey time. And the idea is like he was like, get up. But notice, 
And I think this is important in, this, in kind of the second point, the second idea of how we find deliverance and freedom in our life is this. Notice he had to get up before the chains fell off. The command to get up came before the chains fell off. And again, this is a, kind of plays into the same kind of overarching idea that for many of us, we're waiting for the chains to fall off before we'll get up. The word is there, the promise is there, the power is there. But we're just like, well, it's always been this way, and until I see or feel some miraculous thing, I'm not going to get up. Even though, the, even though the word calls me to get up, even though God's calling me to get up, even though I'm being called to move forward, here's Peter, you know, staggering out of his sleep, and the, Lord's, and the, the angel of the Lord says to him, wake up, get up. And then, and then his chains fall off. You know, I, watch, uh, I like to watch YouTube on my lunch breaks, and sometimes at home too. And well, who am I kidding? All the time at home. But the, uh, I actually, you know, I, I I'd heard this analogy before, so I was like, is this really true? And it is true. When you look at some of the ways that they train elephants in India, and in different places, but primarily India, when they start off with an elephant, they put this gigantic like latch and big old band around his, his uh, foot, with this big old hefty chain or a big like rope that you would see on like, you know, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria or something, but this, you know, this huge rope. And then the, the elephant will just reef on it and try to break free from that. And after a certain amount of time, depending on the elephant, it'll just stop. It'll stop trying to, to break it free. It's really true. And so what they'll do then, once they start, like they take the elephant on circuit to to perform in different places and do different things. When they tie the elephant back up, they use basically like a dog leash. Just this kind of dog leash that's around. So as soon as the elephant feels any kind of tension on its back foot, it just stops. Because it's used to that, it was, it was broken. It's just that's how it works. That's, that's, that's what it's used to. I think a lot of us, that's kind of how, what happens in our lives. When we've been given to sin, or whether it's things that, have, uh, that reach way back, habits, thoughts, ideas that reach way back into our childhood or whatever it might be that we just think that's how it always will be. Anybody ever felt defeated in their sin? Just felt like you said to yourself, I might as well stop trying. There's no reason to, work, to even work on this. It'll never be the same. I'll never be different. I'll always react this way. I'll always worry. I'll always be frightened. I'll always be angry. I'll always respond with lust. I'll always objectify women. I'll always just look at porn. I'll always, whatever it might be, there's a million things. I'll always go back to drink to try to make everything okay. I'll always just yell at my children because I'm impatient. I'll always do these things, right? I'll always just, I'll always just. It's because for so long before we knew Christ, we were slaves to sin. In fact, if you want to flip over there in Romans chapter 6, it's just a fantastic, fantastic passage. It was Martin Luther who said, any Christian that drops their Bible, it should fall open to Romans 6, 7, and 8. But in Romans chapter 6, in the, in, well, let me back up to Romans chapter 5. I actually made the same mistake in the first service. That's funny. Uh, talk about thought loops. But in Romans chapter 5, Paul goes into this doctrine, and you can impress your friends at Christian fellowships, uh, with this doctrine of federal headship. And the doctrine of federal headship is the fact that, according to God, he looks at humanity as in Adam, both seminally and spiritually. So when Adam sinned, God says all human beings sinned in Adam. And so all human beings were condemned in Adam. And in part, that is because of the physical and moral nature of what Adam could create with Eve, which would be another sinner. So all humanity were sinned and were condemned in Adam. And you can go, that's really lame. I don't think you should do that. And that's a different conversation. But because of federal headship that all were condemned in sin in Adam, then anyone who believes and puts their trust in Jesus Christ is made righteous in Christ. That's why it's federal headship. It's the idea that all were condemned in one man 
and then all can be righteous in one man. Does that make sense? So in conclusion to that, in the end of chapter 5, he says, he says, now the law came in to increase uh, uh, the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ. Verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, this is a rhetorical question. He is not saying that a Christian can't sin. He's rhetorically asking, should we as people who when we sin, grace abounds to our life, which we see in Hebrews, which we see in in Isaiah, which is counterintuitive to a works-based gospel, but when I sin, it does have fallout in my life. It does jeopardize my reward in heaven, but it doesn't jeopardize my standing with Christ. So as we of, of, of people of faith who have trusted in Christ and are now made righteous because of what Jesus did, should we continue in sin so that grace can keep coming to me? Where sin abounds, grace abounds. I can keep sinning. I keep getting more grace. This is amazing. It's wonderful. In one sense. So then he asks the question that we all ask, especially the closet legalists. Well, then you're saying you can just sin all you want and nothing happens. And he says, no, that's not what I'm saying. Well, he says, what I'm saying is that we now have a responsibility to God. He starts that responsibility by, by making essentially a giant math equation by saying, look, we were, verse 4, we were buried with him. Verse 3, we were baptized with him. Verse 6, our old self was crucified with him. Verse 8, we died with him. Verse 10, the death that he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So there's like four or, or five we knows. We know we were buried with him. We know that we died with him. We know that we were crucified with him. And we know that because he lives, we live. And he says, because we have these we knows, we know, we know, we know these truths. That The, the, the truth is, the, the law does no longer apply to you. You're not judged by the law anymore, whether it be Israeli law, personal law, the Ten Commandments, the ceremonial law, however you'd like to slice the law pie, you're not accountable to it because you're dead. You died with Christ. But because you died with Christ by faith, and you, you also were crucified with him, your old nature, by faith, it's not imputed to you anymore. You may still have that remnant or echo of the old nature in your mortal body, but that is not who you are anymore, which is why every single letter that Paul ever wrote in the application section of the letter, he always says, stop acting like what you were and start acting like what you are because you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So we don't have to be scared by grace. Nobody's going to get over on God. What happens is when a person steps outside of what God has called that person to do, that person then walks in sin. So even though we reckon these things to be so, it does not mean a person doesn't sin. It doesn't mean that there's no fallout to sin. It means that that sin is not imputed to the person as far as salvation. Does that make sense? We can talk more about that afterwards if you'd like to. But he says, now we have to reckon, or in this it says consider, but verse 11, uh, like for example in the King James is reckon, it's a, it's a Greek accounting term for count up and get the sum. So you know like when you had like, remember when it was really scary, you were like whatever, eight years old, and all of a sudden there was like three numbers to add, and you're like, oh, how am I, oh, carry stuff, oh, right? So it's add it up, write the little line, and get the total. That's literally what he's saying. And the total that we're to pull from Romans 5 and 6 is this, the beginning of 6, is that we are dead with Christ. And sin doesn't have to any longer reign in my moral body. I can reckon it dead. What that does is it's both excellent and scary at the same time. Because in that statement, what happens is I am personally responsible for everything that I do. I'm personally responsible for that because I have power in Christ to be healed and to move away from things that could be very deep-rooted and deep-seated issues. There are some fascinating studies about the brain and the formation in the brain, especially between the ages of 5 and 8. Between the ages of 5 and 8 is when the two halves of your brain are actually starting to connect. 
and you're growing synapses and these different things, and they're connecting to each other. So when you have a tragic event in your life, being molested, being assaulted, being lost at the store, things, something that affected you in a very radical way, it literally, that thought process is literally hardwired into your brain. Now there is, obviously, there's brain, brain uh, uh, neuroplasticity, there's some awesome videos you can watch from different doctors where you can actually watch a brain change. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of practical application from this. None of it is to disregard the scripture or supernatural healing from Jesus. I'm not saying that because of that. What I'm saying is we have an eternal soul, right? That eternal soul operates through a body. That body has a brain, so my soul uses my brain to express itself. Anybody, see, ever, 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 anybody ever here see a, a diabetic that either A, goes, spikes their sugar for too long, and they, go in, they become ketoacidotic, or their sugar drops to like different strokes for different folks, but drops to like 30? Are they normal? No, they're not normal. Ever been really hungry before and being grumpy? Right? You're like, I don't know why I'm so ticked. Clearly, I need a Snickers. You know, whatever it might be, but it's, just, it's one of those things where it happens to us. So your brain, your behavior, your thought life is actually affected by what you do and don't eat. So I think we have to be at least honest about the fact that certain things that occur in our brains, including formation, can affect our thought processes. We're not negating the Bible. In fact, all we're doing is we're noting, wow, the Bible was right 2,000 years ago when they didn't know what neuroplasticity is, when they didn't have any kind of scans, where they had, knew nothing about addiction and how it works. When they knew nothing about like addiction will actually get to the point where it blocks out your neural cortex, or I mean your frontal cortex, cerebral cortex, where like you make decisions. Like right now, if you're thinking and you're deciding, am I going to have tuna or steak for lunch? That's all happening right here. It may be generated from your soul, because maybe deep down in your soul, you're like, I'm a steak person. I don't know. But it actually has to go through your brain. And you can actually watch it light up. They can track the elect This is amazing stuff. They can watch people make decisions. And in drug addicts, many of the decisions are made way in a different part in the brain that completely ignore the cerebral cortex. They don't even use the front part of their brain to make a decision a lot of times because of the way addiction works and the way we like things. When we like things, I hate to say it, when you see somebody that you love and you feel near them, guess what? That's a chemical release in your brain. And we can say, oh, I feel in my soul all we want, and that's probably true too. But the reality is your brain, when you have a fondness for someone, when you feel intimacy, platonic or otherwise, with someone, it's through chemical release. When you like something, when you're doing something that you like, or you're watching something that you like, chemical release. You have, you know, and especially when something is violent or sexual, it can be a, uh, basically a, a memory that is infused with different chemical, whether it be dopamine or whatnot, that will cause that memory to never go away. It can only be removed supernaturally by Christ. So we have these weird brains that are wonderful, that God created, that we have to use to express our souls and be part of what God is doing, right? So because of that, when the Bible talks about reckoning, adding up, being honest, we're not excusing anything because of psychology. What we're doing is we're acknowledging we're complicated, and sitting on our couch and doing nothing is never going to change us. But instead... Moving forward, reckoning, considering, that's going to bring us closer to Christ in returning and resting. He's going to go on and say this, and this is a really important concept in our own walk with Jesus. And the own, remember, we're under the idea here of getting up, getting up before the chains fall off. He says there in verse 15, or excuse me, verse 12, let not sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members as sin in instruments for the unrighteous, uh, excuse me, do not you, uh, present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God 
as those who have been uh, bought, excuse me, brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will not have dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. He goes on, and this is one of the most important concepts that there is in the Scripture for, uh, for believers that want to find victory and freedom in their life. Let not. Let not. What does it mean to let? When your kids come to you and they say something like, they may not say this because that would be weird English, but they say, you know, will you let me do this? Will you let me go to the park? Will you let me what? What they're saying is, will you give me permission and authority to go to the park? Can I do this thing? Paul uses the same language here to say this. Don't let sin reign in your body. The implication is that it doesn't have to. That when we let sin reign, we're letting it happen. We're not coming to the sum, which is that we're set free and that we're, we're alive in Christ because we're crucified with him. We're instead coming to our own sum and denying what he has, whether it's unbelief, I just will never change because of discouragement or whatever, whether it's rebellion, I think God's ways are stupid and he doesn't have much to offer me, whether it's I just don't care, I just want to do what I want to do, which is maybe a subset of rebellion, whatever it might be, we come to this place and we just go, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to let sin reign. Sin feels pretty darn good. Have you ever noticed that? Kind of back to the hatred example and, and the self-medicating example. When we dwell on those things, if we dwell on hating someone, or if we dwell on trying to, trying to find ease from our problems, then that's how we let sin reign. Instead of in the moment calling sin, sin. In the moment saying, no, this is wrong. I shouldn't act this way. I shouldn't say those things. I shouldn't treat somebody this way. I shouldn't think about somebody in that way. I'm going to repent of that. I'm going to turn away from that. See, many of us, again, I'm not trying to be a dead horse here, but I really want to get this point across so to, to, to we can go home with it. How many of us, instead of dealing with our thought processes, our loop thinking, dealing with besetting sin, dealing with the, the troubles of our lives, instead we you know, regress into Netflix or substances or whatever it might be. Because so many times, we just don't, it's hard. So the Christian life is, is usually very, very simple. You know, I was, I was thinking about this the other day. So the Gutenberg Press was invented in, what, like 14-something? 68, 1468, I think it was. First book that came off it was the Gutenberg Bible that was in German. I am all for the centrality of the Scripture. I think the Bible is pretty cool. But do we realize that most human beings didn't have a Bible until the 1700s? There were no daily devotions in the Scripture for, for those people. You were lucky to get a family Bible in, in the 1700s. Lucky. And that was mostly the rich folks that had that. Common people didn't start getting Bibles in, until around the 1800s. And then all of a sudden in America, more printing presses start up, and England, they, they start up these printing. So the idea of having a daily devotion, or the idea of studying the Scripture daily, the idea of, those were non-existent for like 1,800 years after Jesus. I think that's why Jesus tried to keep things really simple and be like, you should love God and your neighbor. Because nobody had a Bible. <laughs> that nobody had things to study. If you wanted to read Isaiah, you didn't just go to your family Isaiah scroll. You had to go to the temple or, or go to one of the synagogues. The New Testament isn't even in a canon until the 300s. And then it's not even printed on the regular. It's hand copied until the 1400s. Am I trying to say the Bible's not important? No, I'm not trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is that people have been, have been being delivered from sin for 1800 years without having a Bible. And they did it by giving their life to Christ, being honest when they didn't love someone or weren't operating out of point of love, inviting the Holy Spirit into their life to change them, and then doing what they could to operate in what they perceived as love led by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is central. The Bible we have today in English is 
trustworthy. It's accurate. And we're blessed to have it. But we can really simplify things. Should we have daily devotions? Yes, you probably should have daily devotions. Because we have, it's here. The way I look at it is that if you look at how much input in life has kind of come forward, like the input that the average person had in 1100 or 1400 versus the input that the average person has today, it's a darn good thing we all have 15 Bibles. Because we get so much stimulus from so much other stuff in life. It's, it, we need the Scripture and to be in it more today than ever probably. But the church lived other than going to church, and a lot of churches didn't even have Bibles. They had scraps. In fact, the early church, there was, a, there was an Aramaic set of the Gospels, and that's pretty much what everybody had for hundreds of years. And then later, Paul's writings got more out there and more out there. So again, I, I hope you hear my heart. I'm not belittling the Bible. I'm not saying it's not important. What I'm saying is that God's been delivering and doing great things in people's lives since beginning of human beings. And it's a very simple thing. It's to love him and repent when I don't see love in my heart for him. And that doesn't mean feel ooey-gooey about God, like I just want to give him a big old hug. It means that I look at what he says, I acknowledge it as truth, and I combat my own mind when it denies it. And the thing, and the point that he makes here is he says, look, ultimately, when he goes on, we're running out of time here. But as he goes on, he says this. He says, don't you know that what you present your members to, that's what you become a slave to. And he says, when you present your members to sin, you become a slave to sin. You put yourself again under the authority of sin, and it reaps something. He says, it reaps death. And doesn't it always, when we dwell on anger or fear or lust or whatever it might be, we dwell on that? Doesn't it just destroy us inside? Doesn't it kill us? Doesn't it kill the people around us? Because no more can we have encouraging conversation. No more can we help somebody who's down in the dumps. No more can we give a Bible promise to someone. We're just right there to commiserate with them and say, yeah, you're right, it's all bunk. I don't know, I don't know. Let's watch The Office, you know, whatever. And so he says there's always a fruit to it. There is all, it's, a, it's, like a, it's like a geometric postulate, only it's spiritual. When we give ourselves to the flesh... When we go outside of the sphere of love, whether it's God or humans, we venture into a place that will only reap death. And when we listen to God, to the vast revelation that we might have, or the tiny, tiny one, when we listen to what God has for us, it leads to a different fruit. It leads to life and inclusion and blessing and care. And it's really not complicated. We don't have to have this memorized. It's great to memorize it. God bless you if you memorize it. But you know what's better than memorizing the Bible? Obeying God. Walking with God. Loving God. Loving humans. Spending our lives on what God tells us to spend our lives on. Investing in what God tells us to invest in. So I I would encourage you. We'll cover, actually, there's a couple other points. One is uh, be ready for the miracle. Um, Do what you're told and follow the leader. (laughs) We'll cover those next week. I never have points. I just went on a whim. I was like feeling motivated or something. But the, uh, but the, the point being is that you have a decision today, today, this very moment, for deliverance and life. And that decision will be the same in 15 minutes from now, in an hour from now, when you go to work tomorrow, when you go to school tomorrow. Well, I guess schools are closed. I don't know. But wherever you end up, when you're, on, when you're on FaceTime with a teacher, I don't, I don't know how, how it works right now, but we always have a decision. You're free. The chains are gone. Don't get fooled. Don't think to yourself, I'm really not free. I'll always be this way. Those are lies of Satan. You won't always be that way. You have a destiny, and it's to be the conformed to the image of Christ. That's what Paul tells us in Romans 8. The bottom line is, are you going to be conformed in this life, or are you going to be conformed through his fiery eyeball as you stand before him in the next. But you will be purified, and you will be with Christ as a believer in Jesus, and you will receive that destiny. I just encourage you to allow that destiny to take place in this life, and be fruitful for his kingdom, and find his peace, and not just try to sit around and wait for the next life. If you like prayer, feel free to come up and pray with you.
Uh, but God bless you. God has great things for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness and your great grace. Lord, it's so comforting for us to know that you're in heaven right now and you're waiting for us that we might be gracious, that you should be gracious to us, I should say. Lord, we're so thankful that, as your scripture promises, that we can come to your throne of grace in time of need. Lord, please forgive us for just allowing our members, yielding our members to sin. Lord, help us to deal with the destruction that we've caused through our angst and our fears and our lusts and our covetousness. Lord, thank you that it's under the blood, but we want to make sure that our fellowship is restored with one another and with you. We pray that you would do miracles in our hearts and our lives. We pray that you would take situations where we just think it'll never change and that you would bring about miraculous change. Help us, Lord, to confess where we're wrong, to uh, send your Holy Spirit and convict us when we're in our crazy thought loops. And Lord, help us instead to focus on you, to keep our eyes upon heaven where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Lord, we're praying for miracles in our lives. We're praying for miracles in our community. And that you would just do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think. Thanks for being so kind to us. We're really glad for that. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.